Wrestling fans around the corner around the world, I'm Dan Marani. Bill Eady, Axe Demolition. Unbelievable, a brand new wrestling inside us is now. Wrestling fans, it's that time of year again. Boston Wrestling MWF is headed back to Tampa, Florida after a WrestleMania week of fun. It's time to bring you live Wrestling Insider episodes and cyber autograph signings galore for our 10th Paul Bear Holiday Headlocks Toy Drive mission. If you weren't with us at Memorial Hall in Melrose on November the 13th, don't worry, we're going to have VIP packages galore along with live online experiences. We've announced that the Toy Drive captain, WWE Hall of Famer Gerald Briscoe, will be with us live on the December 1st, and then joining us later that night will be future Hall of Famer, a man that's seen it all, a man that's done it all, the one, the only, Dutch Mantel, a.k.a. Zeb Coulter. Like Briscoe, Dutch was with us in Tampa earlier this year. Look for some great, fun, insightful conversation on December the 1st and beyond, along with some great autographed materials. For complete information and VIP packages, visit bostonwrestling.com. More superstar and legends announcements to come. This is Mick Foley. This is Harley Race. This is Shelton Benjamin. This is Mr. Wonderful Paul Orndorff. This is the Monster Abyss. And this is Daniel Bryan. This is JBL and you're watching the MWF. Be there live. Wrestling fans around the corner, around the world, Dan Moratti and Billy D here back for another installment of Wrestling Insiders as we look at the year WWF 1987 and uh, we take some interesting GPS turns as we tell this story, but that makes it all the more fun. It's like a road trip that you guys can just either listen to or watch. Yeah, well, you, you, know, you keep bringing up interesting people. Yeah. And I have memories of most of them, so uh, this is to relate to the fans and they want to know some inside dope so you know folks it, it, as we noted with tony atlas it's kind of a, a disappointing frustrating situation at least right now hopefully to try and be optimistic we hope that it changes course as time goes on but one thing both tony and i wanted was bill to become a regular on the wrestling inside a series and we're giving it a test we're bringing you multiple episodes and we're interested in your reaction again if you're watching the premiere Share your thoughts in that chat box. I'm usually almost always on watching during the premiere. I know our moderators are always trying to help out. And if you're not with us during the premiere, during our summer of 7 p.m., leave some thoughts in the comment section below. What you guys think matters to us. I know maybe you don't think so with what you see on WWE, but we're not WWE. We're far more humble. Not like how the Sheik wants to do it, though, but that's all right. Uh, <laughs> uh, we want to send out some special thanks. We forget to do that sometimes. Our good friends uh, a block down the street in between here and Memorial Hall where we're going to be uh, going back to the 80s Saturday night, November the 13th uh, here in Melrose. Big Our, night. Big night. Huge night. Red Rose here in Melrose. I mean, could they be any better to oh, us? Oh, my goodness. Fantastic. They're, their food's terrific. I mean, anybody that gets an opportunity, be a patron, please. Red Rose here in Melrose, what is unbelievable to me, Bill, is Melrose is a very, very quiet town, as you've probably noticed through your travels through here. It is a dry town for the most part. A couple of places, you know, if you buy a certain amount of food, they'll let you have a beverage or two. But Red Rose is the only establishment I know of in the city that's open until 2 a.m. Oh, my goodness. So you can get some great piping hot, fresh Chinese food until 2 o'clock in the morning if you're in this area where we tape out of in Melrose. There's some great fine folks. My buddy Jack Sai has done a great job taking over that establishment, turning it into a first-class place. Again, uh, just Google Red Rose, Melrose, Massachusetts. It'll take you right to the website. When, once you look at their menu, you'll be drooling. Trust me. Trust, you can, <laughs> you can see. You, trust me, it's good. And I also want to thank our friends over at Noel Salon, Bill. 347 Pleasant Street in Malden, a hop, skip, and a jump away from us for all your hair needs. Visit noelsalon.com if they can make me look you know, somewhat reasonably good, certainly not as handsome as this man. Imagine what they can do for you. Uh, primarily, they have the lovely ladies that come in, but they welcome men as well if you're in need of a haircut. 781-324-9779. Uh, Ask for our good friend, Hollywood Barani. 
Holly, I'm sure you've even heard of Hollywood. Yeah, I have. Hollywood Barani, she is something else. She came direct from Ethiopia, from Hollywood Studios, and now she's over in Malden doing people's hair and making them look like a million bucks. I, they said I look like three bucks, but you know what? I guess that's better than nothing, right? Well, it depends on where you start. <laughs> All right, let's get back into the thick of things, Bill. That TV taping that kicked off June of 1987, we mentioned last time, we had the Vince McMahon talent meeting about the Sheik and Duggan firing and the cocaine testing that was coming. We talked about Bam Bam. We talked about the Rockers one night in. Uh, from a historical point of view, though, maybe the biggest thing that happened that night was um, in one of the stranger pieces of that time period, you look back at WrestleMania three. Ricky Steamboat and Randy Savage had a match for the ages that night. Come June, Ricky Steamboat wants to take time off so he can spend time with this baby just as they're giving him the belt, which was probably the worst time to ever ask for time off, one would think. Well, one would think. <laughs> <coughs> and it's, uh, you talk about choreographed. I was watching the, the Savage. Have you seen that bi uh, biography? I've heard about it. I have not seen it yet. I wasn't aware. Of course, we never worked with, with, with Savage, but Steamboat on the video, <coughs> excuse me, said they had 63 or 64 spots. Almost like this. Facts to him, he said, right? Facts to him that they had to memorize. <laughs> now, and it was me, a great match to watch. Yeah, but <coughs> to me, that's that's not working. That's yeah. You gotta you gotta what if the people didn't buy a couple of those moves? You gotta listen to the crowd. I mean well, what if they, fortunately that was a outstanding match. What if they forgot and went out of sequence and got screwed up a little bit? Yeah. But I was there again, I must be easily astonished at my older age. But I would have never done that. I was never trained to do that. You, you learn a little bit of it, but you also have to pay attention to the fans. What about, what if someone in an earlier match had done three or four of those spots? Yeah. You wouldn't get any good reaction. Right. Well, and you know, the funny thing is, I ultimately think, <coughs> and I don't know, I've, it's not like I ever sat down with Randy Savage and had this conversation, but I think Randy ultimately wanted what they got, which was a match that was considered an all-time classic. I'll tell you this. In late 1986, they worked back-to-back -back months at the Boston Garden, I believe in October and November of 86, and they had excellent, outstanding matches that I'm sure they didn't sit down and, you know, fax each other 64 spots for a Boston Garden house show. I just think maybe S Savage wanted to go over the top at WrestleMania, would be my guess. Well, I'm know. sure. I'm sure he did. But uh, I was just amazed by that. A little odd. Yeah, I really have never heard of anything like that. I, no. I, I haven't seen the documentary. Um, and Hogan in, in the documentary mentions that periodically when they were working, he would send them uh, him text or papers and stuff like that. And, really? And Hogan said, you know, wait a minute, you know, just years ago when we were brought up, you, you work backwards. The finishes are most important. You get that straight, you're okay. Listen to the people. They might not be buying what you're talking, what you're doing. And Savage was very good. I mean, it's not like oh, he, yeah. he didn't I mean, it's need, not, I don't think he needed that. The more I, I watch these videos, the more I'm, I'm amazed. I mean, it's, uh, it's like us talking, you know. It's, you learn something all the time. So back to that, again, that, that infamous set of TV tapings. Uh, Ricky wants time off. Vince McMahon says you can take a lot of time off, and we're going to take the title from you. Enjoy the baby. Um, I think I think that was pressure from his wife. You think so? Yeah, he, she wanted uh, uh, more time. In, in rightfully so. I mean, most human beings would want to be around their newborn, but yeah. we understand the craziness that is this industry. Yeah. That's not something you do, especially after you're given the prestige of that championship belt 
in front of 93,000 people at the Pontiac Silverdome. Yeah. They had big plans for Ricky Steamboat, yeah. not for him to go vanish, right. to spend time with his baby. Right. I mean, he really, I, in my opinion, I think he couldn't have picked a worse time to ask for the time off. Do no. you? And I think it, when, he came, when he did finally come back, didn't he come back as the dragon? That was several years later. He came yeah. back sporadically from 87 into 88, and then he was gone. So again, we, we talked about with Bam Bam in the previous episode, but this Ricky Steamboat having one of the great, even now that's looked back upon as one of the great WrestleMania matches of all time yeah. at WrestleMania three, he finished up at WrestleMania four as a job, you know, I don't want to say a jobber, but you know, putting over Greg Valentine who was going nowhere in a, uh, that heavyweight title tournament that they yeah. had. But we'll get to that as time goes on. But, I just, as someone that had a kid of your own, could you imagine when you got a championship in WWF and then, you know, a couple of weeks later you say, I'd like well, to we take had, six we months had, off? We, yeah, we had, the, we had the championship. No, but I mean, could you imagine after no. they gave it to you and saying, thanks, Vince, <coughs> I need six months off now. I, it, it's just not how it works. Well, you never know what goes through their head, right? Yeah. Yeah, and like you said, you never know what's going on in their home, too, with their, yeah. their personal life. I know the wife at one point, and again, you're talking fast-forwarding many, many moons, but when he got divorced, his wife wound up owning his name. Wow. He couldn't do anything as Ricky Steamboat. And I, I, I think, I don't know if it was WWF that bought it out, but he, he can be Ricky Steamboat now. But for a long time, his wife, Bonnie, owned the rights to everything Ricky the Dragon Steamboat. Now, how Isn't did that, that come about? I have no idea. Something through the divorce? It was a what? weird situation. He, could, well, he had to be Richard Blood. Why would, you, why would you agree to that? You'd have to be a pretty, I would think, without knowing the insides of their home, a very vicious woman to want to try and take the man's name that he worked so hard to build for so many decades to provide for that family. And but what, one and, man's opinion. And what is she going to gain? Because she's not going to get in the ring and use it. I, I have no idea. Maybe she was almost like Bill Watts' wife when she kind of held the UWF Mid-South Library hostage for so long. Maybe part of it was spike. I, Maybe I thank part God of it I've was had, financial. I thank God I've got a wonderful woman that's stuck by me. And You and Barry did good. Yeah. I, I mean, you look at the wrestling marriages, the fact that both of you are still married to the same great ladies after all yeah. these years, that's really a testament to not only you guys, but the ladies. Hey, I know I'm the king of the, the castle when she's got, not there. <laughs> <laughs> when she's out chopping, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but okay, so again, to try and stick with the, the timeline we're working with, Ricky Steamboat wants out. Vince McMahon says, go take your time, but we're taking the belt. They wanted to put it on the natural Butch Reed. Uh, Butch was having some substance abuse problems. He was no-showing some events. Do you think Butch, uh, if sober or clear-headed, do you think he would have been a good choice to be the new Intercontinental champion? Oh, yeah, I champion? do. I do. Uh, and that might have straightened him up. I think maybe Butch was having some problems because he had a, some aspirations and maybe some promises when he came in there that may or may not have been lived up to. But I think by handing him that championship and that title, uh, I think he would have done a good job. He was, he was over. Uh, it was a good gimmick. Him yeah. and Slick had a good chemistry together. And not to bring it up again, but there again, we got one of our friends that passed on. It just. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Yeah, Butch passed not too long so. ago. My God. Now, did, did, uh, did you have a relationship with Butch or no Butch from the territory? I, I knew Butch. From going in and out of mid uh, mid south, mm -hmm. yes, he came in and out of uh, mid Atlantic, and he came in and out of Georgia. Had a number of matches with him before he was the natural. Mm -hmm. He was just Butch Reed. Well, he was just hacksaw hacksaw Butch yeah. Reed, right? And uh, good athlete, strong dude. Uh, never heard anybody have any com bad comments about him. I think he would have been a good choice. In some of the interviews we've done with other folks that have been here in this studio, they said long before WWF, he was one of the top five guys in the business at his peak. 
that him and Flair could hang for an hour, night after yeah. night after night. Was Butch Reed really that good? He was good. I mean, I, I never, some... I, I've never seen footage of him from anything other than WWF, yeah. so I don't know. But what was he one of, considered one of the elite guys in the business for a period of time? He was considered one of the top guys. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Wow. But uh, it's a shame that he wound up breaking down to the substances or whatever it was that held him back. Yeah. Well, you don't. He know. really I missed mean... the boat. Yeah, he did. Because that could have been a huge opportunity for him. And I tell you this, if they ever did give him that belt back at a time when belts actually had value, think of the value he would have had out on the circuit after WWF and after WCW. Yeah. He would have been much more in demand and been able to command much more money on independence, fan fests, and things like that afterwards. So he really shot himself in the foot. By, with all those no-shows where they felt they couldn't trust the title on them. Right. Um, I had a, a question that popped up in my mind that wasn't on the, the notes when we were going back and forth about that. But, um, well, ultimately, the title went to the Honky Tonk Man. And he had the longest, uh, still the longest reigning Intercontinental Champion of all time. Uh, a kind of a goofy gimmick. I remember when he first came in as a baby face, I hated the Honky Tonk Man. But then when they turned him heel, I tell you, I hated him for all the right reasons. Right. There was a guy that no matter who they put him with, the heat was just hot. I mean, he drew great, he did good business on top with Jake. He drew great with Beefcake. Yes. He did outstanding, that, the feud he had with Randy Savage was so hot. I remember they did a night in the garden. It was a rematch from the month before. It was Honky and Savage, and they had Jimmy Hart, and what did they call it, the shock cage, where he was hanging in the little thing from the top of the building so he couldn't interfere. And Macho was spitting at him, and the, Jimmy didn't want to get in the cage, and the ref said, if you don't get in by 10, Macho's going to get the Intercontinental title. I mean, that feud was white hot. Yeah. There were, even after he dropped the title to the Warrior, those rematches did good business. I mean, for a, a gimmick that was very limited, and for a guy, to be fair, if you look at his in-ring move for move isn't considered one of the all-time greats, Honky Tonk Man had one hell of a run. Oh, he had a terrific run. He was uh, he's a good friend of ours. And, uh, yeah, you're right. He had good matches with uh, all the guys that you had mentioned. It's just, And even to have good matches with Ultimate Warrior. <laughs> I, mean, I don't know if they were great, but they drew reasonably right, well. Right. Yeah. But uh, and he still has the title, right? Still has the still has the reign. The reign. They, they they screwed you guys over, but not oh, hockey well, yet. No, that's they can do what they want to. It's um, yeah, but he honky tonk's a good guy. We see him probably <coughs> well pre COVID and now maybe after COVID. Five or six times a year. The fans have always wanted him to come to this studio. They think he'd be a he lot of fun. He would be interesting. He'd be. He'd have a lot to say. Yeah. That's for sure. Um, but because he doesn't hold back. No, no, he's very opinionated. But that that macho man honky tonk feud that between the big angles they did on the NBC Saturday Night's main event shows and uh, just great feud. But uh, were you kind of were you surprised maybe to see Honky as the Intercontinental Champion? with that great roster of talent that they had at that time. No, not really. Really? Uh, okay. Uh, Did you think he was a, a guy that fit the role? I, I, you have I to, was shocked. Well, you have to listen to the fan reaction, and he always got the negative reaction. For heel, that's what you want. So uh, there's a lot of guys that they try to push that got very little reaction. Yeah. So I think that's one time where maybe they... Maybe they listen to the fans. So. Well, it worked magic. Even here in Boston a few times where he would always draw. Jake, in 87, you know the problems he had. He, first he was injured, then he failed the cocaine test and was out for a while. But he wound up working Bruno a few times. And even those did huge business. Bruno and Honky Tonk for the Intercontinental title. I wasn't aware of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They did a singles match in July of 87 in Boston. And then they did a very rare 8.30 p.m. start time in a very hot building in August of 87. It was 
Honky and the Heart Foundation against Bruno, Jake, and Tito. And that was Bruno's last match in Boston mm. when he did that six-man. Um, but I, just to me, it was a surprise. I couldn't believe that Honky Tonk Man was the new winner. From a fan point of view, is uh, how old would I have been at that point? Six, <laughs> seven. So I, I just I didn't expect it. Yeah. It came out of the blue, but it worked like magic. He had a hell of a run. Yeah, he did. Now, we mentioned his reign, and, and I kind of hinted at it a, a few minutes ago, but were you aware of what WWE did with your demolitions reign a couple of years back with New Day? Uh, or did you not don't even pay attention to something well, like we, that? Well, we, we were, of course, notified that it was what had happened. Bill Apter and a bunch of people called us and asked us for our opinion and uh, some remarks on it. Of course, we don't, I don't know any of the New Day. And uh, Kofi wrestled for us. He's from this area. Yeah. He is, I tell you, this, <coughs> he may not be the biggest dog in the fight, but I think he's one of the greatest athletes in the history of that company. Well, you know, they seem to be uh, good guys. And for us to have that title champion reign for all those years, means something, uh, and records are made to be broken, I guess, so it didn't upset us. Uh, the thing that proved to be a little disturbing, and there again, we have no control, shortly after that, a couple couple days after that, they disbanded them, didn't they? They lost the titles just a, a week after, yeah. I think, as soon as they broke And then they broke record. them up. Yeah. So. No, no, they still stuck together as a unit. They didn't really break them up until last fall, as a matter of yeah. fact. Big E is a single on SmackDown, and Kofi and Xavier Woods are a tag team on Raw. But uh, again, Kofi is, uh, I, just, I think he's one of the great athletes in the history of that company. He's a very good human being. He's helped us a lot with some of our charitable endeavors, yeah. which I appreciate. And that's, that's what Barry and I heard. So, I mean, we wish him nothing but success. It's just. You want to know why? But, but to me, and, and I. And I I hate to make it sound like I'm knocking Kofi, because I think the world of Kofi, uh, his brother's another good guy, too, the, the little one that you met yesterday. Every time we're at the events, Kofi's brother goes a lot when they're in town, because Kofi's from this area. I don't know if you know that. No, I didn't know yeah, that. Yeah, he's a couple of cities away where we lived. Um, so his family and whatnot goes. And the little one gets excited when he sees Kofi's brother, because he thinks he's buddy-buddy with him. But uh, again, a good egg. But see, to me, here's the difference. When you guys had the tag team championship for your run, it was very, very important. When New Day had the title, and it's, it has nothing to do with New Day, again, it's all about the presentation, they were probably jobbing on TV 50% of the time in non-title matches. Because now, unless they announce it on TV that it's a title match, it's a non-title match. And you have champions that lose as much as they win, which is another reason why oh I think the God. championship belts mean nothing other than the, the two the WWE Championship and the Universal Championship that, as of right now, Roman Reigns and Bobby Lashley hold. Other than that, the championship belts are a joke. How I, much value I, is a championship belt going to have if the champion loses half the time on free TV? I didn't know that. It's pathetic. Well, see, I don't watch. Yeah. And I'm sure Barry doesn't know it either. So, yeah, it, it diminishes the uh, it diminishes the team or the individual and also the belts. So, I, I, Here's one thing I think that everybody in wrestling has lost track of when everyone worries about five-star matches and big spots and internet approval and you know little videos on Facebook and Twitter. The one thing that always gets people over is when they win. Yeah. <laughs> have you ever seen someone not, have you ever seen someone less over because they win their matches, it's, it's, simple, it's a simple formula. You can't go wrong with it. You want to get someone over, have them win. You want to have them be a credible champion, have them win. When you have them lose, I mean, how does that help anybody? Well, it's just uncreative t TV. There again, it's, it's selected who's losing. There are certain guys I'm sure that probably never lost, right? Well, I, R Roman hasn't done any jobs in yeah. non-title matches since he's become the right. universal champion. And right. off the top of my head, 
Lashley, I don't think, has. But I, again, I know you don't watch it a heck of a lot, but are you familiar with Drew McIntyre? I've, I've seen him. As I'm, I've seen him. I, I've never watched a match. I'm not huge on him, but last year, pre-COVID, they really wanted to go with him and give him a chance. And you know Lesnar, obviously. Um, yeah. They did a gimmick where Lesnar, were, as the champion, went into the Royal Rumble and was going to win the Royal Rumble. Uh, he went in, and it was I was there. It was at the... Um, the baseball stadium in Houston, Minute Maid Park. Great atmosphere, 40,000 people. Lesnar kicked the shit out of 14, 15 guys before McIntyre came out. And McIntyre eliminated him, but decisively. Lesnar laid on the floor for a good three or four minutes. And, you know, McIntyre was just eyeing him like a dog, ready to attack. And they, they wound up building up two. Uh, what would have been the main event in Tampa at Raymond James Stadium that ultimately turned into the warehouse WrestleMania where there were no fans. And unfortunately, that's where McIntyre got the title in front of no fans. To me, even though I wasn't the world's biggest Drew McIntyre guy, they should have never had that man lose until the fans were back again. To get, uh, yeah. to gauge that organic reaction from the fans as opposed to well, what are they saying on Twitter about him this week? You know what I mean? It's hard to tell what the fans really thought where there were no fans around. And then, what do they do? He had a decent enough run, but he dropped the title needlessly to Randy Orton for three weeks, who certainly didn't need it at how over Randy Orton is. And then earlier this year, he lost it to The Miz. So by the time they put McIntyre in the main event against Lashley <clears throat> this year at WrestleMania in Tampa, he'd already dropped the title twice in a year. And, and I don't think he was anywhere near as over as a result of it. One, one man's opinion. I mean, you can overcome doing jobs. Yeah. But I think when you have a guy that's new, kind of fresh as a main eventer, I think you should keep him as hot as you can until you have a chance to find out, okay, is this someone we can go with for the short term? Is this someone we can go with for the long term? Or is this someone we can build the company around? They never really gave the guy that chance by having him lose in front of no people, in now, my opinion. Is he the champion now? Or no, is... Lashley is. Oh. And I think Lashley makes for a much better champion, in my personal opinion. But I also think at the same time, while I personally prefer Lashley, I think they should have given McIntyre the chance to be the champion, not having lost until they had fans come back. I think they missed the boat. Well, One man's opinion. Yeah, I agree with you. It's... Uh, it... <laughs> Listening to you talk about all these things that are going on, I'm, I'm glad I don't really watch it because it sounds like it's chaotic there. It's, uh, and you wonder, <clears throat> some of the things that they plan, and they spend hours and hours and hours and days planning it, and it's switched minutes before the taping. So Talk about chaotic, yeah. Uh, Sometimes that's even that's in what the, it sounds like. Sometimes even in the middle of the show. I'm, I've been told by guys that are there now that, you know, they're getting updated scripts and so on and outlines. Yeah, and it's... it's uh, Mayhem. It's, it, you know... There needs to be... How much really... Look at what it is that's being produced. You're not going to reinvent the wheel every week on Monday Night Raw. How much do you really need to change in the middle of a show that's going to tweak it and make it that much better? As you continue to see the ratings decline and decline and decline and decline, it's 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 almost like there's a viewer monitor on the number of viewers there, and as it, oh God, oh God, let's change it. You know what I'm saying? In the middle of a like that change is going to change. Yeah, right. Three hundred thousand people, they're not watching it now. You're not going to get them this week. With the buzz, you might get a hundred more thousand. It, it's not going to happen instantaneously. There is no patience and there's no pacing. I think those are the two biggest problems they have right now. I mean, you, and again, where does it come from, Dan? From the top. And who's at the top? Uh, Mr. McMahon. I just and you know, another thing that gets me about those shows, instead of saying, oh, you know, sometimes they'll shoot a pretty good angle. But then instead of saying, all right, next week, the main event on Raw is blah, 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 they'll have it later on in the same show. Well, here's, you know, here's the thing that, and I, I actually feel sorry for the creative people 
Triple H. Oh my God, they must go nuts. Triple H and yeah. all these other people that are working. You know, they put a lot of time and effort into this. To have it, boom, no. No. The student, no. Here's a, here's a, it, I've wondered this for the last, and maybe he, I don't, maybe he's gone. I don't know. Who was the guy that was the heavy set, bearded guy that he was one of the Vikings or something? The Viking Raiders? Yeah. Wasn't there a shorter one? A tag one? team? Yeah. Wasn't there a shorter one, one guy that they were pushing as a baby face for a period of time? You mean Otis? Otis. <laughs> now, he was hot, supposed to be the hottest thing since sliced bread, right? For how many weeks? They shoved that guy down people's throats yeah, so and bad. Where's he at now? And nothing. Mid-card forgotten about. Why? They, they built the entire show around him for months. They gave him the, the hottest woman. They, you know, they broke up his tag team needlessly. Yes. And, you know, again, you talk about horrendous booking. Okay, Otis is part of a tag team heavy machinery. He's in the middle of a big program. The partner turned on him in a big match, and he wound up losing. And what did they do? They never even, the two, Otis and Tucker, the tag team that turned on each other, they never even had a match. They put Tucker on Raw, and they kept Otis on SmackDown. And they were and really going to push released. him, right? He was, he was in the main event of everything. Okay, for how long? Months. He was the, What's he doing now again? Nothing. Well, he's in a mid-card tag team. Why? Now. Because people got sick of the overexposure. They didn't want to see him in three or four segments mm -hmm. a week. They, I don't think there's anybody they want to see three or four there segments a week. There we go back to what we were talking about before. Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. What's the only day they're not on? Saturday. Okay, Saturday. Six nights a week, and then now you got the biography. Yeah. And then you got the, is that Peacock streaming yet? Yeah, that's, they, they're streaming away, baby. How much what, can is you... Is that segment two, baby? Thank you, Justin. How much can you see? I just think it, the, the problem is, for those that do engage with it, is the, the lack of variety. Exactly. We, th there is nothing that makes it must-see TV. When you exactly. know you're going to see the same people, not just every week, but in a lot of cases, multiple times a week. Yeah. You know, when again, we talk about the good old days, but I mean, you know, Demolition wasn't on TV every week. When you were, it, 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 oh, wow, Demolition's on this week. And usually it was a squash match to build up whatever house show was coming to town or whatever pay-per-view was coming up. And it was to build up to something bigger. Nothing is built up anymore. And it's at, that, at that time, how many hours a week were wrestling on? One? Well, in Boston, we had Superstars and Challenge. We had Prime Time on the USA Network, which was two hours. We had two or three NWA shows on TBS. No, I'm talking about Oh, just WWF? WWF? How many days a week? Two times, maybe? Saturday, we had two shows. Spotlight. We got that would always fluctuate. That would change sometimes. You had All American on Sunday morning at noon, and you had Prime Time on Monday night. But again, mostly enhancement matches to try and build talent up instead of giving the the featured matches away right. for free. So you're saying maybe two nights a week yeah. total. Yeah. All right. Now you got a million people, or a million and a half people, watching seven nights a week. If it was only two, you'd have a million and a half people for those five nights on those two nights. It would be so it. you'd be up to about six or seven million again. But well, my God, if you if you got like we talked the other day, I love football. But if football was on seven nights a week, there's a couple games that I don't want to watch anyway. Right. A couple teams I don't care about. That, the viewership has to choose what they're going to do. The wife might want to go someplace. They might want to go <coughs> to dinner or a movie or a combination of both. And I uh, try and sit through them because we do review-style podcasts. And let me tell you, it is, it's a chore a lot of the times yeah. to try and sit through some of those shows. But again, we're getting a signal from the back. Our good friend Justin, I mean... Do we have some great help, or do we have some great, great help? Great, fantastic. Help? I mean, in some of our previous tapings, we had... Uh, I saw those guys 
earlier painting the walls. Paint, really? Yeah. Are they really putting them to work? We yeah. had Dave helping us out. We had uh, Jackie the Joke Man helping us out. We had, for the very first time, our junior ambassador, Devon Brent, trying to learn some of the equipment. Today we have Justin back there, man in the ship for the time being. Other great help is coming as the day goes on. We are very blessed to have such great help because let me tell you guys something. We talk about how there's no wrestling without wrestling fans. Without the guys that you don't see behind the camera, if we didn't have them helping, Bill and I would be sitting in a dark room probably doing, a, if nothing else, a podcast-style interview over a telephone. Yep. And I think this is much better. Oh, dear. All right. All right, wrestling fans, right now we're going to take a brief time out again. Don't forget, gee, someone really, they, they must be spying on us. Must be those iPhones spying on us. Yes. Check out the great merchandise in the eBay store. It helps keep wrestling legends working, coming into the studio. And you get an Ania shout-out when you pick up some great wrestling merchandise for your collection just like this. Wrestling fans, welcome back to Wrestling Inside as we are here with Demolition Axe, Bill Eady, who we are hoping, I'm almost <coughs> begging and pleading with the man for him to become a weekly regular on this show. We've been having a lot of fun this far. Uh, we've I don't know if I could work the hours you put in, my friend. Well, you know, at least you get to go home. <laughs> I tell you, the night, I don't know if I noted it on the show, but just the night before you came in, 10 a.m. to 1 a.m., and then I had to be back early the next morning to do a little work before we picked you up at the airport. I, I really have lost my mind. I have not had a day off from this place since we got back from WrestleMania. And even people could say, well, you went to Florida, but even when we were in yeah, Florida, we were doing interviews every day. Yeah, you are working. <laughs> well, you know what? You can't fault me for work ethic. I guess that's the Italian in me. I don't know. I don't know. But uh, also, as we roll back into the world of WWF 1987, a uh, brief return, uh, a man that was introduced kind of as an enforcer, Mr. T. Any memories of Mr. T? He was brought in for that spot where they said he was going to be this guest enforcer and other than some house shows I, I i don't think he was ever seen again as a wwf character no we didn't we weren't uh most of the time i think he was probably in other towns uh and that but i mean if he did three or four shots that year i think that would have been a lot yeah and they were all non-televised yeah so do you did you interact would you ever meet mr t no well we said hello and yeah. shook hands and stuff like that but uh as far as going out to dinner and stuff yeah. like that or sitting for lengthy conversations, no. I just thought it was odd they'd put him on TV, they'd introduce him in that role, and then, especially where he meant so much to WrestleMania 1. Well, maybe, I mean, he helped sell that maybe show. Maybe the financial arrangements weren't met. Maybe, but you'd think before they'd shoot the angle to put him on TV and say they were going to do it, they would have figured all that stuff out. Maybe they would have done the same thing with Missy Hyatt we talked about. Well, yeah, Missy's Manor, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I don't know. Yeah, strange to see Mr. T. Puff into thin air. Now a WWE Hall of Famer, he had one of the more infamous speeches in Hall of Fame history where he was kind of cut off in the middle of his speech. When oh, they, really? He, he went on and on about his, <coughs> his mother for about 20 minutes, and they sent out Kane to kind of end it. <laughs> I don't know. Mr. T got a heck of a lot of time, and we're still waiting on demolition. But what are you going to do? That's a different story for a different time. Now, the guy that came in in the spring of 87 to try and freshen up the roster, a guy that had a pretty good run for three years, left right around the same time you did too, ravishing Rick Rude. Yeah. Any memories of Rick Rude? Oh, Rick was a good, good guy. I mean, a uh, real close friend of Barry, grew up. Uh, Another Minnesota guy. Yeah, in Minnesota near Barry. Barry. And Barry, I don't know if they went to the same high school or competitive high schools, but uh, uh, Rick was a talented guy. He was pretty good on the mic. Uh, he was good in the ring. Uh, and uh, I've got a lot of good positive memories of him. He always seemed to be smiling. Uh, I know he had some differences with certain people, but it never spilled over to, you know, fisticuffs and stuff like that. 
Good guy. Um, tough guy, <coughs> from what I was told, too. I'm sorry? Tough guy. Evidently he was. He was... Uh, <coughs> I don't know if he was an amateur boxer. I think, yeah. I think he was, uh, now that you mention it. Yeah, he could take care of himself. Yeah. But uh, I know he was uh, an arm wrestler. Yeah. So... Yeah. Yeah, I had a, I saw him, well, he lived not too far from me in, in oh, Atlanta, really? in Atlanta, when he moved down to WCW. <coughs> Same town, just on the other side of town. And uh, would see him, bumped into him in the store and stuff like mm -hmm. that. Another one that we lost far too soon, I think he was only 40. Oh, my goodness, yeah. It was... Uh, 40. Oh, uh, I don't know. And, and, and uh, if the story is true, and uh, maybe the oddest of circumstances I've ever heard of one of the guys passing away. What did you hear? That he was shooting pure Viagra into his penis. I didn't, I, I know he was, uh, I don't know about the shooting directly into, but I know he was taking a lot of Viagra at the time. Uh, did he really need it that much? I don't know. I, I mean, mean I, I never asked him. <laughs> not about to it. make a joke out of it, I but never, I mean, but, I, uh, I've never heard of it. We've had a lot of odd deaths in this crazy industry, but I've never heard of anyone passing because of Viagra. Well, I, what I heard was there was other drugs involved. Oh, okay, maybe a mixture. Yeah, and uh, and that's too bad. Yeah, the, I mean, this is a guy that had even, I, from what I heard, he was training for a comeback. Yeah. Uh, Another one that seemed to, uh, once that Lloyd's of London policy ran out, all of a sudden they seemed like they found the magic recipe for a comeback. Yeah. And I think at that point, if he was able to come back in 99, he could have been a main eventer in either one of those companies. Oh, and yeah. made some big money. I think yeah. Austin and Rude in WWF, imagine that. Yeah. I think that would have been a hot program. Yeah. Where there were so many older, established guys in WCW, Maybe he wouldn't have had as much value as he could have to WWF, but still, he looked great at the age of 40. Oh, yeah. If he could go at even, almost like Mr. Perfect after his Lloyds of London expired and he had his comeback, even if he could go at, you That's know, a wonder why Lloyds of London doesn't do the insurance policy anymore. Yeah, and it was a lot of guys from Minnesota, too, for some reason. Yeah. I know Animal, same thing. You know, he, for some reason, he, he could only wrestle in tag team matches. Singles matches, no, but tag team matches, yes. Yeah. Wh which is another. Well, I think the I think the guy that originated that policy was a friend of Joe's. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. So that explains why all the Minnesota guys were yeah. in on it. <clears throat> yeah. And, and and like you said, unfortunately nowadays there's no more Lloyd's of London for people that may need it. But you know, it's a shame if Rude could have had that big comeback. Think of the money he could have, you know, had for his family. Yeah. Even for even if he worked just a couple of more years. Yeah. And another sad thing was, uh, I knew his, one of his sons. Oh, yeah. And I he, think I know where you're going with And he, he got killed in a motorcycle accident yeah. not too long. Recently. Uh, it was only within the past yeah. couple of years, right? Yeah. In the same town, in Rome, Georgia. Uh, I think he was attending uh, Shorter University where my grandson played ball. And uh, I think he got hit by a car. Wow. Yeah. Sad. Just for the whole family, my yeah. God. First Rick at the age of 40. Yeah. And then... I think the, the boy the was like 21 or something like yeah. that. Yeah, the poor wife. <clears throat> she must have gone through, my God. Yeah. With not one, but two deaths like Whew. that. Horrible. Absolutely horrible. Uh, you know, you mentioned, though, that a guy that could handle himself. Marty had said on the show before that he, he initially had some issues with Warrior. That he had... Uh, Rude did? Yeah, he had to kind of physically straighten out in the ring with, with Rick. I was. I, I was, mean, with Warrior. Yeah, I wasn't aware of that. So. Yeah. It, we saw, I mean, we it may have Warrior happened. was very stiff with them, and he got tired of Warrior being stiff. Uh, Warrior with was stiff with everybody. Yeah. But that wasn't Warrior's fault. Warrior just didn't know any better. Uh, you know, I knew Jim from years ago, before he came up there, and he was always green. Uh, he was always stiff. And, you know, Barry and I have talked about it, a number of guys have talked about it, and they probably, 
I don't really think that Warrior appreciated the business. He liked the money. He was making good money, but as far as protecting the business, caring about the boys, uh, that's my opinion. A lot of people might say, well, he's the greatest thing since blah, 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 and, and you're not. So I'm just saying our dealings with him. And I think if Joe was here and Mike were here, they'd tell you the same thing. Because mm -hmm. we had some we had some matches, tag, oh, six-man six tags. Yep. Oh, we're going to get there as we get into 1990. And, uh, I, I so remember, if, was it there? Was, if it wasn't for Joe and Mike being involved, in, they were stinker roots. <laughs> Well, I, when they brought him in, it seemed like they tried to protect him. He came in in 87, just like you guys, a little further down the road. Um, he, he had a little bit of fame from world class as the Dingo Warrior. Uh, I think they came up with a better name as Ultimate Warrior. But he was kind of hidden on the C-team, B-team house shows for a long period of time. Uh, do, do you think try and give him more experience? Was he even worse when he first came in than when he, when, when he became well, champion? Course, uh, yeah. Yeah. Then that, th those must have been some tough matches for the Barry Horowitzes and Steve Lombardis that he was working with every night well, to try and you'll help You'll have him. to ask those guys because they, prob they probably suffered. Yeah. Yeah, but no, Marty said that the one night they showed up at a house show, Rude was there very, very early drinking beer, which they thought was odd because that wasn't how he normally mm. operated. And Rude and Warrior went out. Uh, I guess Warrior was stiff with them a couple of times. Rude got him in a headlock and got him down on the mat, and I guess it almost choked the life out of him, saying, do you want to work? Do you want to shoot? Then there was some kind of an angle after the match, maybe a count-out finish, where Rude was running away with the title belt when he was in a Continental Champion and Warrior was chasing him, and Warrior was supposed to pull the belt away, and Warrior went to pull it, Rude wouldn't let go, and Warrior just kind of backed off which must have been odd to the fans at that house show that night, yeah. but apparently after that, there was no more problems. I think, if I remember, I don't know if it was in one of his books, but Bobby Heenan told a similar story about Andre working with Warrior like that, that he was too stiff, and then one night, you know, Andre liked to do that spot where he'd get stuck in the ropes, and Warrior came charging at him full speed, and he st stuck out that foot, and almost knocked, <laughs> knocked him into the balcony. And I guess Warrior lightened up after that at that point, too. So maybe he just, maybe he needed guidance. Well, I, I know for a fact that Andre didn't like the Warrior. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, there was a couple guys that Andre didn't like, and all the guys would watch the matches, and that was one of the matches we'd watch. <laughs> Another one was Jake Roberts. Uh, Andre, wouldn't, wouldn't he kind of stand on his hair and try and... stand on Jake's hair and... <laughs> Pulled both of his arms up, <laughs> and he didn't like uh, Iron Sheik either. Yeah, the Sheik has told those stories on yeah. how Andre used to step on his face, and yeah. oh my God, I not remember, someone that you'd want to make an enemy. I out remember of. Warrior coming in the dressing room a couple of times when we're sitting in there, and he's working with uh, uh, Warrior, and Warrior's asking him, uh, "Well, what do you want to do, boss? What are we going to do?" And I remember Andre looking up and said, whatever I want to do. <laughs> and that would be the situation. Really, yeah. Yeah. Well, I, that's another interesting uh, antidote I want to talk about once we get to 1989. But as 1987 rolled along, again, the Dingo Warrior becomes an ultimate warrior. What about Jake Roberts? I mean, he went through a heck of a lot in 1987. We alluded to it a little bit. Uh, he claims... Uh, leading up to WrestleMania 3 on the Snake Pit, the talk show that he used to host, Honky Tonk Man leading up to WrestleMania 3, when he hit him with the guitar, the guitar wasn't gimmicked, and it caused him a lot of, you know, lifetime physical problems uh, that maybe is what led to an increased problems with the cocaine and the booze and whatnot. Uh, he was out of action due to an arm injury in 87. He was one of the first that failed the drug test and was actually sent to rehab. I don't know if he was maybe someone that they set the example with in the summer of 87 uh, by sending someone to rehab like that to try and overcome their problems. But, you know, as someone that was in locker rooms with them, what were you observing with, with the Jake Roberts? Was he hurting? Was, he, was it substances? Was it a mixture of both? Someone that was so great and had so much to offer the business really had a bad year and was falling apart at the seams. Well, I, I don't think it was just a bad year. I think it was things leading up to that year. Mm -hmm. 
It may have been a combination of things. But uh, Jake's a good friend of ours. Uh, and I'm, I'm glad to see that he's straightened out, and I hope it continues. Uh, but like you said, it's not always, and I like that phrase, it's not demons, it's choices. And Jake was making choices. Mm. And the choices he was making weren't going to benefit him. Um, as far as the gimmicked or not gimmicked, uh, I've heard that <coughs> mentioned a couple times. I don't know if it was true or not, but maybe that was the reason for making choices. You know, I, I, I don't know. I, I don't, I'm not in Jake's shoes. Um, I can't imagine it was a pleasant experience if it wasn't gimmick. Right. I mean, that was a baseball bat like swing. Well, it was sort of like, shot at it was him. sort of like Tully hitting Barry. Like you mentioned, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And that's too bad if that's the case, because you know what? As we've noted, life for the boys was tough enough as it was being on the road yeah. 300 days a year in a non-territory system where there was just so much having to be up so early, flying in the air yeah. from city to city, coast to coast, day after day, away from home, 50, 60 days, like you mentioned. The Sheik said one time he did 92 straight days without a day off. Oh, yeah. I mean, it, it was the treatment of a circus animal, and then you throw into it, you know, on top of the, the normal aches and pains that your body goes through working in wrestling, you know, an injury like that, I'm sure it would have affected his neck, I imagine, the way he got hit in the head with the guitar if it wasn't gimmick. Just almost like snooker with the coconut, just a, a bad, bad situation. And if you took a guy that already had problems, I mean, I don't know how much you know about Jake's past, but it's a pretty dark story his entire life. Yeah, I was around Jake in Georgia, Mid-Atlantic, Mid-South. Uh, that's what I'm saying. That particular year wasn't the only year. Yeah. It was a lot of things built up to that year. And then you, you top it off with that injury, <coughs> which requires probably, if two pills are working, four pills will do better. If four right? will work, six will work better. Yeah, so it's, it's choices. Uh, there again, I mean, I can't put myself in their shoes. I'm ju I just thank God that I never experienced that. And just what a horrible life he talked about in, in different interviews, and I, uh, maybe that documentary that he was in is where I heard it. But, you know, Grizzly Smith had him with, when the mother was 13. I mean, that's pretty dark. He alluded to the fact that, you know, he had sex with the mother at different points. And, I mean, that's just... What kind of a life is that for a kid? Forget about the pro wrestler, Jake Roberts. Uh, I, I, I don't know if I can pronounce his first name. Is it Aurelian or? or Aurelian. Or, or, Aurelian? Aurelian yeah. Smith. Think of what that, as a kid, what he went through with that, you know? I hate to think about it. It's horrible. And, and you know what? I hate, maybe it makes me look like the fool, but I, I have tried, because I think Jake has so much to offer professional wrestling if he's clear-headed. Yeah. He knows showed us three different times. And you talk about why would you keep going to that well over and over again, but you know, the first time was an error in judgment. The second time was one of those times he said supposedly cleaned up. And then there was an incident at a, an independent show in Ohio when he, he decided to take out the Damien that was attached to him from under, under his pants. Then the third time, I, I, don't, that, bl yeah. I don't blame him, I blame he was involved with some of those DDP people who have done a great job, but I guess there was one that was kind of on the sleazy side. He, he respected the past that we had with Jake and gave us a great deal, but then the same weekend when Jake was going to come in, I guess he wound up getting multiple appearances for him in New York, and, he, and that wasn't even on Jake, that was on this quote-unquote agent, canceled them on us again. So. I still think Jake has a heck of a lot to offer professional wrestling. The yeah. fans love him. Um, he created great memories. But what about Jake the Snake you know as a human being? Beyond the drugs, beyond the booze, who was Jake the Snake to you? Was he a good guy? Was he a prick? Was he a... No, no. Uh, every time we've had 
And we, we saw Jake not too long ago uh, at a signing. Uh, and like I said, I'm glad he, he looks much better, looks healthier, uh, seemed to have his ducks in a row, and I hope it continues. And we're going to see him. Uh, we're doing an uh, appearance with him in. Uh, we just got the commitment from the, the promoter uh, in the early part of August. Okay. Up in uh, Springfield, Massachusetts. Well, he was originally slated to be part of the Back to the 80s uh, WrestleFest. Hopefully, that uh, we're yeah. trying to sort that out with him because. It's difficult to try and navigate everybody's schedules all over again yeah. for the same night, but we're hoping, again, knock on wood, he'll be with us November the 13th. Uh, he was actually going to be the first go-around with us in studio as well, and I think he'd have yeah. some, some very interesting oh, stories. Oh, he would. And I, he's working now with the AEW, correct? Right? Yeah, yeah, he's a manager there now. They, they brought him in with a bang. He was cutting some great promos, but the, the guy that they have him with now, they kind of he's kind of in no man's land right now, so he's not doing anything of great relevance, I guess, is the best way to put it. But you know what? I'm happy that the man has a contract and he's earning a living. Yeah. Because he went a long time without one. Yeah. And maybe if he didn't make some of the bad choices that he made as a result of some of the horrible experiences he had in his life, who knows how different things could have been. Well, you, you know, know you, when you have those problems, you, you never get rid of them. You have to fight them every day. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I just pray and hope that Every day goes well for him. Yeah. You know, cause what more can I you like ask? Jake. I, I, we always had uh, good conversations, uh, and like you say, he knows the business. He's got a he's got a mind for the business. He just got sidetracked periodically, but uh, I hope he does well. He was another one of those guys. No matter who they put him in with, the fans absolutely loved it. They yeah. loved Jake. Yeah. That DDT chant would start early on. And it would go throughout the entire match. The anticipation would build to see what's inside the bag. And, you know, it's just a shame. That, again, 87, it was just maybe that was the year when the straw that broke the camel's back, maybe. Yeah. Where some just what already was a difficult life, a difficult existence, well, a, some bad choices already made were made even worse. And it's, if it was because of maybe that one incident, what a waste, you know? when someone could have been more respectful of the human being that was taking the shot, you know? I heard some stories years ago when I was in Mid-South about Grizzly. And uh, maybe why I was naive, I couldn't believe him, but and listening and talking to Jake, evidently that was true, so. I mean, I'm just, I had a sheltered life. I had a good father and mother, and they protected me. And I try to do the same thing for my kids and my grandkids. So, you know, unless you walk in somebody's shoes, you can't make a judgment on them. It's tough. Yeah, you're right. But you can only go through the observations. Yeah. But I think at the end of the day, the one person that Jake Roberts hurt the most was himself. Oh, Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. He would have been in the office, I guarantee you for uh, WWE. For a short period of time, they gave him a shot his, on the creative team yeah. in 96. Yeah. Dur I think that was during his religious comeback. Um, and, you know, Mick Foley said in his book he was still getting high every night. <laughs> but he, he tried. You know, and, and, you know it, it, to be fair, what's the best way to word this? There is the clean that you'd talk about with your friends and family and whatnot. And then that sometimes there's the wrestling version of clean, which is a little different. <laughs> you know what I mean? I it's a little different. different. Yeah, and I it's think, a little different. I think Jake was doing that for a number of years. Yeah. I think he's clean now, but you got to guard, man. I mean, <clears throat> the few years in respect to the multiple years of addiction, the few years of staying clean, you got to keep going that, keep going forward. Yeah. Well, again, we can only hope for the best for Jake. I still continue to believe he'd be a great guest to have in this studio and to have with us uh, at least one live event and see how it goes. Now that you know it's been such a long span where he has been clean and sober, you know, we're trying to sort out the details. I don't even know. Again, by the time this airs, hopefully we'll have some positive news. Yeah. I can only hope for the best because I think he has a lot to offer, 
not just the fans, but again, even the, the young independent guys. I think he's a wise Well, perhaps he's helping them man. down there in AEW. You know, that's, he's got that opportunity. So yeah. if they listen, you know, a lot of young guys, uh, Barry and I go to a lot of events. Now we'll probably be going a lot more. And uh, somebody will come up to me and say, uh, hey, Bill, can you watch my match and give me some feedback? And I always preface it with, do you want me to watch the match and tell you how good you are? Or do you want me to watch the match and tell you what I think? I'll watch the match. Just let me know what you want me to tell you. Because some guys don't want to. If you tell them something that wasn't so positive, ah, oh, you're just an old son of a bitch. Right. If, if, if they're really truthful and what, then I, I do it. But... There's no sense in me or Barry wasting our time right, right. giving advice to somebody who's going to walk away and say, oh, those assholes can't do nothing anyway. So. What do, do you, any mm. memories of Damien? The poor snake. He, he went through, from what I was told, a lot of abuse. The only, the only memories that I, I'm glad we didn't work with Jake <laughs> uh, against him. We could have worked with him against him because I'm not letting that snake bite me. If the snake comes out and I'm supposed to be on the mat, I'm taking up and leaving. And they, some guys didn't mind him. Some guys well, didn't remember my. That's that's not me. I like, unfortunately, I like snakeskin boots, oh. and shoes. But that's after they're dead. I'm not. I don't want a snake in a house. I'm not going to abuse it. I'm just going to get somebody to remove it. But. My daughter one time came, I think it was just shock effect, my oldest daughter, came and I was sitting at home and she came in, she sits down on the couch and she's got a boa constrictor around her neck. A real one? A real one. Did she know it? Of course she knew it. She came in because she knows I don't want to be around her. Oh, she was doing it to rib you. Yeah. <laughs> so I looked over and I continued watching the TV and I said, Julie, you and the snake have to leave the house right now. And she got up, of course, and left. But it was, she was trying to rib me. Yeah. Well, I wanted to keep it as a pet. I said, keep it in somebody else's house. <laughs> How many kids do you have, Bill? I don't even know if I know. Just one? Mm -hmm. Oh, no. Two daughters. Did you hold up two fingers? Two, I held up. Well, I was holding the top oh, of them. Oh, okay. Well, I, no, I, I was just trying to show you how bad my vision is that I couldn't no, even tell two you. Two girls. Two girls? Oh, that must have kept you busy when you were home, my God. Yeah. Um, Fortunately, but, my wife took care of all that, so. And that's, I don't know if I could handle a girl. Uh, the two boys that my ex has was tough. Yeah. To think about the life and the circumstances and the situations that little girls face. Well, I think. I, I don't know if I'd have the patience. I, I would worry too much. I worry too much about the boys, never mind a little girl. I think that. Uh, their out would have been, do you know who my dad is? Yeah. So yeah. That, that would help. That would have been a great safety net. Yeah. Um, but, different, I mean, some of the things that the, I've, that the guys have told in the studio, I mean, shooting the poor Damien up with steroids, I mean, what a horrible thing to do to the poor thing, just sitting in a bag. It can't see. It can't move. Uh, another one, Davy Boy Smith was almost picking up the bag and hurling it in the air, saying, I don't want this snake in the locker room. Then he'd take it again, pick it up, and throw it in the air. I don't want this snake in the locker room. Um, one time, and what I thought was a hilarious story, someone really was putting the boots to him before a match between Jake and Andre, and uh, by the, t the snake went nuts. He, when the time came for him to come out of the bag, he <laughs> hissed and went right into Andre and bit him. And Andre, when he came back to the locker room, there was a piece of the, that snake's tooth in Andre's chest. And they said, Andre, you're bleeding. And he just, he kind of, oh, 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 oh. I guess the snake was mad and just pulled it out like it was nothing. That probably would have given me a heart attack if the, sh the snake oh, yeah. shot out at me like that. Yeah. But I mean, did you have a shower when the, sh the snake was around? I mean... I was told that was another thing, to keep it cool. Jake would yeah, sometimes it, let him hang out in the shower. In, and in a couple of the uh, 
the buildings we were there, and it's, he, this, he had the snake in the in the shower and stuff like that. It, I, I just wasn't comfortable around it. So you wouldn't shower when Damien was in there? Uh, shower quickly with my <laughs> eyes watching it. Yeah. <laughs> Did you ever see him rise up at all, or just was oh, he? Oh yeah, there? but there were so many different snakes. Yeah, oh yeah, it wasn't like there was one. I remember. Yeah. I don't know if it was Marty, but someone told us about a story, and you know they'd have to put him with the baggage, and it <laughs> brought him up to Canada, and the poor snake was frozen, froze to death when they took him off the plane. Yeah. So the, the, he, I guess the Damians rotated on a yeah. regular basis, yeah. but you know, tough life for those pets too. Imagine living in that little sack, yeah, being abused and, by guys and, and, and aggressive hey, and the bulldog, uh, and the par and the parrot. Frankie, yeah. You know, I don't know if, uh, like you say, we talked about Peacock. I don't know if they'd allow that stuff nowadays because yeah. of the animal rights people. Right, right, right. Well, remember, it was after you left, so I don't have a problem going into do it now, but um, you remember Earthquake John Tenta? Mm -hmm. do, you, do you remember the angle they did when he splashed poor Damien and killed him? No. Oh, it was one of the, it was 91, so you were gone. It was probably about six, May of 91. Um, you know, Jake was injured or hurt in the ring, and then Earthquake and Jimmy Hart, they took a gimmick bag and put it in the ring, and he ran back and forth, and then he did that big sit-down splash on Damien and supposedly killed him. And all the, animal, <laughs> all the animal rights people will go into all the house shows that Jake well, I can understand that for guys. But, um, and then Vince was wise. They said, do you want to see what he killed? And they brought out the bag, and it was some kind of gimmick. And it, well, obviously, it wasn't a real snake. But it, to me, as a kid, I thought it was, oh, my, I couldn't believe my eyes yeah. when I saw an earthquake I mean, that's one, snake. That, that's one of the uh, early steps of criminology. Yeah. So, you know, you couldn't, that's, that's probably not. I wonder not, if that's something they'll let it off the, the peacock. Oh, earthquake, I'm sure. Earthquake, squash, sure. and Damien. I'm sure. But you know what? You want to know the one thing that gets me about peacock? If it's me, and I understand where they're coming from, but you have to look at it, you know, WWE it is, they want to label it as entertainment. So why don't you have G-rated movies, PG-rated, PG-13, R-rated movies, and then that way you can incorporate everything. You just, you put up a big disclaimer of what it is that you're going to watch before you're allowed to view it. That's how I would do Viewer it. Viewer discretion. Viewer discretion is advised. But there, is, there are R-rated movies that adults can watch and enjoy. I wouldn't want my kid at six years old to watch some of that stuff. I agree. Yeah, but I, I think agree. I don't think it should be totally eliminated. I think it should be accessible in a certain way, whether it be a password maybe that the parents you have to put in to make sure that kids can't get to it. But I wouldn't eliminate everything because, like you said, for better or worse, a lot of it is pro wrestling history. And not only in pro wrestling. Look at the education system right now. They're trying to rewrite history. That, that things never occurred. Well, yes, they did. You learn from history. Yep. Try not to repeat it. But if it was never occurred, and you do it, whose fault is it? Well, you're a big guy when it comes to the history. Yeah. You love your history. It just, it, it's asinine. You know, this, this, I'm not going to get political, but it, Things like that, uh, them trying to eliminate this and eliminate that, and they're taken away from what I did or what I was involved with or, you know, you loved. Yeah. So. I don't know, wrestling fans. We got the sign from my good friend Justin in the back. Heck of a podcast. Talk about a creative guy. Came up with the name Justin with Justin. That's a creative guy. We have back there helping us out. We appreciate the help, all of our great staff, and we appreciate all of the great fans watching at home. Again, let us know what you think of tonight's show in the little chat box. Don't forget the super chat button is open for business. Help us keep the lights on, as they like to say at comedy shows, in concerts. Don't forget to tip the bartender. We're giving you some great entertainment you can enjoy from home or wherever you may be as you access these shows. Um, so many ways you can help that don't cost a penny. Give us a big thumbs up. Uh, let YouTube know you enjoy the content. Subscribe to the YouTube channel. It's absolutely free with over 2,000 videos.
for you to enjoy at your discretion. It lets YouTube showcase our videos to new fans that don't know we exist yet. If we can continue to build, again, I just don't want to have Bill on with us every week. I'd love to have Barry on with us, Demolition Smash every week. We'd love to have Jake Roberts on every week. The more fans that are engaged in these shows, the more superstars we can have with us. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's a pretty simple process. And again, if you could be kind enough, share the links across social media. There's Facebook, there's Twitter, there's Reddit, there's Facebook wrestling groups, there's wrestling websites. There's so many fans that gave up on wrestling in the 80s, that gave up on it in the 90s, that would find a talk show like this riveting, I think. I know I would, even if I gave up on watching wrestling. I'd love to hear about the stories about these guys nowadays. And of course, there's so many other ways you can help. With, as we've noted, the Super Chat. We have our eBay store with great merchandise. That helps bring more wrestling legends in. And we give you an on-air shout-out on one of these shows. One of the superstars personally thanks you. And the big one, we mention it all the time, Patreon. If you don't just want to be a fan, if you just don't want to be a friend, if you want early ad-free access to all of these great talk shows, if you want access to the Studio Shoot Interview Library, hundreds of them that have been seen by millions online, millions on The Howard Stern Show, some Patreon exclusive, plus the knowledge that you, your fine self, when you wake up in the morning and you're brushing your teeth, getting ready for work, and you're looking in that mirror, you can say, you know what? I'm helping keep professional wrestling legends working during the oddest times, the toughest times, that non-contracted WWE and AEW talent have faced in this coronavirus world with the lack of events and opportunities to earn an income. The place to be, patreon.com backslash Boston Wrestling. You can find all the links about everything we've talked about in the description box below. Again, Bill, I thank you for joining us. A blast as always. You're the welcome. time just flew by, but we're going to be talking more WWF 1987 the next time Bill is with us. Until we speak again, folks, you and yours be well, stay healthy, good night. Thank you for joining us. Please give the video a big thumbs up, leave us a comment, and subscribe to the channel to enjoy more great content. Don't forget, you can help keep wrestling legends working. Check out our eBay store and join the Boston Wrestling family at patreon.com backslash Boston Wrestling so we can produce more in-depth shoot interviews.